we are for the next in the series of interviews celebrating 10 years of synesthesia. Today's theme is gamification and I'm joined today by Natasha Scott, CEO and Creative Director for MyTail. Natasha, hi, how are you today? Hi, excellent. Uh, and hello from sunny Finland for change. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. It's so great to have you with us today. Thank you for being able to join us. And thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be part of this. Wonderful. Um, Natasha, I'm going to get straight into it because you have got such an interesting background. Um, I really enjoyed reading your, your biographies on various sites about the, the different things that you've done. Um, but I would, like, I would like you to describe it to us in your words. Um, share with us a little bit about what brought you to this world of gaming, please. Uh, yeah, uh, well, it's a very broad, actually, uh, well, very, very wide story. So I'm just going to try to be as short as possible there. Well, first of all, I, I never thought that I would be actually ending up in the games industry per se. I, I was just a gamer, like a hardcore nerd <laughs> my whole life. Um, and games were, and, and plus besides like games as, as an experience that I was as a kid always fascinated with, uh, but that's due to my parents. I mean, my parents were... Uh, even that none of them were in games or tech actually development or anything like that, but they were very uh, also geeky in that sense that we had the consoles and computers and everything from very early stage, as soon as possible, basically, people would have. So I was privileged in that way that I grew up by having pretty much everything and anything I wanted from, well, computers and, and uh, games and consoles, even the very old handheld uh, consoles. So um, so I, I grew up with, with games as a part of normal, <laughs> normal life. And also this was one of these things that really was escape from reality when it comes to um, being able to do so many other things that you would like to do. For example, you know, being a Tomb Raider, <laughs> if nothing else as a, you know, as, as a, a uh, young girl uh, who was not really understood with the games and being a gamer, because as, as someone who grew up also in Belgrade, Serbia, at that time, um, it was not necessarily normal that girls would be playing games. Uh, but my parents were always encouraging and supporting both me and my sister, actually. And I mean, I, I think I, um, well, I do remember reading that you've, you had a, a background in, in classical art, didn't you? I'm, you studied Roman painting, I think. Oh, yes. So my, my actual, like my university education, I finished um, uh, in, in University of Arts in Belgrade, uh, traditional painting uh, techniques, especially my master's was in classical Roman painting techniques, such as fresco mosaics graffito and all other beautiful stuff which i'm sure you know what i'm talking about but to be honest here in in nordics barely anyone understands when i speak about these things um still this is something that um because i i was always besides being an artist i i always i mean this sort of traditional artist i also was very much into digital stuff um and, and especially graphic design and so on so i was combining either way both traditional and kind of like uh let's say contemporary approaches as well. Um, but what one thing that really has always been um, a big part of my, I mean, passion or, or within my heart is uh, visual storytelling. So this is something that especially now through games uh, as, as interactive medium, gives so much additional kind of opportunity for storytelling. And so this is where I, I'm really having most of the uh, fun and also expertise actually uh to to um to contribute in the in the game development with this sort of like how to create the overall um uh, storytelling experience sure that's very cool i'm getting a sense of game development as an art form um more yeah. than a, a technology <laughs> form yeah wonderful and you you've said then about storytelling so um just thinking there about your inspirations for for games and game development how much of real life like real life <laughs> um goes into the games that you develop i mean just like in any art form pretty much all of it i mean when you think about art art any any art form it's connected to its time 
it's connected to um, connecting to another part of the or other parts of time or other people or like it's all about again experiences so and games they're not just experiences that where you are having like in in any other medium books or movies or so where you are having this sort of monologue of the creator towards the audience but here we have a dialogue between the creator and the actual user meaning player so it it builds much bigger in my opinion this sort of as a medium i mean games as a medium bu builds much uh, stronger emotional bond uh, with your let's say viewers or users or however you want to call it <laughs> as an art form so co context plays plays an important part um Absolutely. No, yeah and what you just made me think of then actually i was just thinking about how with other art um you know like um paintings and literature actually i was specifically thinking um with paintings and with poetry there's mm -hmm. nothing the artist can do about the 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 user you know the whoever's who, whoever's receiving the art um the well, about the user's interpretation okay if i see that that's what i see if i understand that from the poem that's what i understand um that's taken to a whole other level in game development isn't it because your users your uh, you know they they interact with your art form they change your art form they they change the story <laughs> I have so much to say on this. Okay, yeah. well, first of all, as an art art creator, whatever whatever type of art form we are talking about here, but let's let's talk about visual just for the sake of simplicity. Uh, because with with games, there is additional part of audio visual because music and sound makes a huge impact together with the visual, and it's a whole exp it it attacks quite many like all the senses basically. But we can we will talk about it slightly later. Just the thing here, like when you think about the First of all, uh, visual um, and visual narrative, especially from the painting perspective, to simplify. Um, it's not true that it's up to only your uh, particular, how, how, you how you perceive it. Um, first of all, we as, as humans, um, I mean, our brains work in that way that first of all, image stays intact in our, like, um, in our memory much longer than any other medium any <laughs> so so uh, this is one thing that first of all image impacts us a lot secondly the artist always with all the elements of the traditional um art creation like when you are planning the from the composition um uh color scheme um uh, atmosphere um uh, all the parts i mean from the you know like harmony this <laughs> this, <laughs> this harmony and everything else it's like um you are guiding like when you think about the, the allegories, like a wall art pieces. Uh, you have the whole stories that are done, like so adaptation from the text to image in a way that you are guiding also viewer where to focus on where, how, and how story actually progresses all in that one image. Um, and this is where, again, iconography, semiotics, and all other parts of kind of actual art theory comes in hand to actually get even deeper. But as a viewer, there are much more kind of layers to it. First of all, it can be impact literally of your own personal interests and tastes. Uh, so kind of like besides objective art theory, what actually something means and wants to be kind of understood, but it's more like, it's also the mood. Um, how do you feel about uh, this particular, the, how, how your life situation is in order that how you receive information, any information. And this is also how art as well can impact us in so many different ways, depending on so many moving pieces around us all the time. It, it is also basically, especially for those who play games a lot, I can tell you from my personal experience, I, it's very hard for me to say, I don't have one favorite game. I don't even have 10 favorite games. I have dozens and dozens of favorite games because it really depends on the mood and the mindset and everything else where I'm at when I play what. There are days that I just want to shoot the hell out of stuff. There are days that I want to do uh, uh, point and click and kind of like, uh, you know, like, or, or doing detective stuff or doing puzzles, like literally simple puzzles. Unlike in the art piece that you are just, let's say, having that message from the artist to the, to the receiver. Uh, as an active member, first of all, it's, it's not that active in the sense that 
there is illusion of a choice that you have in a game because we developers we very carefully design everything and we know what's going to happen all like everything is predetermined anyway but player doesn't know that player is going through that discovery and feeling of this sort of empowerment and so on so there is um so so, so it's it's illusion that there is a choice I'm here to talk about gamification and i feel like so far we've talked about art and i'm about to move us into the realm of psychology because when you said then the illusion of choice um it makes me think that there would be psychologists that would say that games reflect life very closely. Like the illusion of choice is something that we live every day, right? Um, and that's something that you've just said is, is fundamental, is, is, is integral to how games are developed. Um, I imagine that there's a, you already want to say something, so I'm just going to stop. You go. No, no, so just to give to this, uh, actually the old, well, I mean, it's not old, it's still relatable, but uh, it's not as as the society is developing also forward, even in the min many other levels as a society. Um, uh, this is also another thing that what what is the play? So basically one thing would be that, uh, because there are theories that of course, like um, the play is kind of learning the life um, skills, so to say. So when you think about kids, learning, watching adults and learning by imitating adults to do in their play, in their everyday play. Let's say it used to be that girls are having tea parties and take care of the baby dolls and so on because they're preparing to be mothers. And on the other hand, boys were fixing cars because they're prepared to do the manly man work. That's not true anymore. Now, I mean, even my daughter is into robotics. Now girls are building robots, boys are cooking. And, and this is how it should be. So it's a different kind. But yes, definitely play and games. This is where the beauty of about games in general, especially in gamification, and, I, um, and I'll <laughs> try to be short on gamification. I could talk so much about it. Uh, but the thing is that it gives the safe environment to try stuff, whatever it is. And through gamification, especially if you're using gaming technology for education, healthcare, but also any kind of industrial work or, or education also there and so on. This is where you're actually creating this sort of safe environment for people to try things out and not really, and learn how to deal with failure. Because games as a medium, again, um, one of the things that games are really good at and always have been super good at is at teaching. What I mean by that? is that you have, for example, whatever game world you are creating, whatever rules, what's good and what's bad or whatever you're supposed to do in the game, the game teaches you about all of that which is inside of that game. And the most uh, interesting part there, especially psychologically, is that in the games, players, even when you fail, you wanna try again, you wanna, tr you wanna do better, you wanna actually either, you know, defeat whatever is there to that is your challenge or you know get better at the, your own score or your friend's score whatever your motivations are there is this self-governed motivation and learning which games kind of um, spark in us and now this is the part of the commercial game development which i think we should really focus on when we create gamified solutions because when we are gamifying things, one of the biggest problems so far is that wrong people are involved with creating gamified solutions. Um, as a certified teacher, I can say this. As a teacher, the teacher focuses on uh, curriculum, on the stuff that student has to go through. Not teachers that necessarily play game. I mean, teachers in general necessarily don't play games. Don't They're not game designers or, or any. So this is where asking teachers to make a gamified version of whatever they are experts in is not fair. It's not their job to do that. So this is where in the past, at least uh, we have seen a lot of not so successful gamified solutions because once again, who has been working on those? So the only way to have a successful gamified solution is that you really get experts from various fields that that uh, tool requires and that these people work together in that common goal. So that means that the teacher with the game designers, with the all other, like, and really test from day one with the final user, which is not a teacher, but the student, <laughs> basically, you need to involve them in the process as well. 
So this is this is much more complex than one thing that just digitalizing something. That's not gamification. So basically, you have a broccoli and dipping it in chocolate. It's still a broccoli inside. So it's not gonna that chocolate is not gonna make any <laughs> difference. So you have to make something completely uh, from the scratch up, unique for that particular need and aim of the gamified product that you're creating. And um, what you just made me think was that when you dip broccoli in chocolate, I mean, not only is that going to be but um, you ruin the broccoli and you ruin the chocolate, right? So nothing good happens there. This is what gamification products mostly have been the case in the past decade. A lot of broccoli chocolate everywhere. Um, I think that's been seen in a lot of other sectors as well, that, you know, just by digitizing something doesn't make it a digital experience. Um, it doesn't, it just simply doesn't work like that. Um, and I, I think we're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. But just while we, we were still on the piece about inspiration and about the game development um, piece, we spoke about how real life affects game development. And I just wanted to ask you, given the year that we've had, um, thinking about the pandemic, how much do you think that has actually influenced game development? Do you see that in, you know, how have you seen that manifest in your work? Well, first of all, in practice, when it comes to game developers around the world, I don't think our work, we are used to working globally and with partners across the globe. So basically, yeah, it would be nice that we are more often in the actual office with actual team members, but this didn't stop us in any way to do what we do, even from our own home or wherever we are. So our work didn't really change much. Um, secondly, we have seen also that the games industry has bloomed better, more than ever uh, when it comes to business, because now people are at home and playing games uh, like more. Um, even if more than before, <laughs> but uh, so so we can see business otherwise like blooming. But more importantly, I can I can say that what also is happening, especially with the gamification, because there have been a lot of uh, ed tech companies who have been show, saying and showing like, hey, we need like for for the sake of supporting the professionals in their field, education, healthcare, therapy well-being whatever like various ways where you are having um kind of where, where gamification actually you know is needed and and the ways how you can assist these professionals to work in different ways with their uh, uh clients or bringing these ideas together and going back to your point about education um i just wonder if you've got some examples for me or if you've got some more detail on that please on that piece um, at all. Um, gaming and education for, for young people, for the next generation, how can those two things work together? Um, yeah. Uh, well, if we talk about the game technology used in creating gamified solutions and tools and something, so again, this is something that, uh, it's just another medium and another tool. So basically, one uh, when it comes to education and and teach, I mean, teachers are in no risk whatsoever, ever, <laughs> nor should be uh, that there is nothing to replace teachers, never will be, or therapists or any other expert in the field. Uh, but these, um, I mean, let's say any kind of tool, just like so far, whatever they have been using <laughs> for their their needs, this is just another tool that should be designed to help them to reach the goal and aim that they have for every individual uh, uh, case or student or client. Again, depends on what kind of gamified and, and educational material we are talking about. Um, so, so because one thing about education and the, the two, like one, one thing that it's really uh, stepping out again, uh, where games or gamified technology can, can um, uh, give a lot of input is about um, allowing individual to really reach the best way of learning and engaging with the content based on their personal needs and abilities. Because the fact is, all of us, 
especially when we talk about learning. We learn things differently. We approach things differently. We understand things differently. Even if you and I are now watching a movie, again, based just from the current mood, did we sleep enough last night? Will it affect how we have, you know, received that information, how we really, you know, watch that movie. But especially with the learning, because something that has to stick in your head, um, we, we do it differently. Someone is better by you know, doing stuff by hand, someone by reading about it, someone by listening about it. So basically, through gaming technology, you allow that every individual can actually use that content in a way that fits them the best. So basically being accessible and being adjusted to their specific needs. And we have seen that, especially in the healthcare and therapy tools, how much that actually makes an impact uh, on, on the learning and, and uh, let's say, healthcare, uh, or, or this sort of like, let's say, or, or the therapy progress, how it improves by utilizing this sort of adjusting certain content. Because with the uh, traditional curriculum of, of uh, teaching is something that, you know, it's, it's object, like it's, it's supposed to be equal and objective to everyone. But again, all of us are different. So this is where actually that's not working really well now, is it? And we can see that, of course, with students, how differently they are struggling with certain, you know, like subjects, but then they're better with others. And then they are like, but then again, because you need to progress in your education. So you need to have, let's say, I remember I was, I needed to have straight A's. I wanted to have straight A's. My, my parents were never understanding that, <laughs> my ambition, but I had my goal to go to the state academy and do this and that, but for that I needed, it was very big competition. So basically if I wanted that, I had to have straight A's, I had to do this and that. So I pushed myself to, to actually overcome a lot of personal challenges that I had in certain subjects to have these straight A's, which were not my cup of tea, to achieve. But the thing is that we shouldn't do that. <laughs> so everyone should do the best uh, I mean, the, the, the games allow or gaming technology allows you to actually learn and achieve what you need in whichever way fits you. Um, so, so this is where I think uh, the evolution again of, of education um, and one thing in Finland, because besides Finland is, I mean, um, the system here and educators here, uh, if we are again talking only about education, but this also goes to the healthcare and everywhere else. Everyone is very much open minded to um, work with other professionals from other fields. So this co-creation with, let's say, developers, teachers and, and who are like it's, it's a normal thing here and people are not afraid of, of trying things out and experimenting, um, also including students there and so on. And this is, I think, one of the again, reasons why Finland is kind of number one in education so because it's yeah let's try it out because there is no fear of of novelty there is no fear of something like what are you being afraid that actually someone will discover something that will help you as a teacher to work better and do do easier your job it's like why would you be against that so um but of course in many other countries even within you know Europe it's not really the case um so so this is something that it's it's a part of this will be a part of like slow evolution but it's getting there and and pandemic has shown the need for such that's for sure that, uh, that's definitely true i mean i couldn't agree with you more that um an environment in which an individual's um passion and interest and capabilities are nurtured um and mm. encouraged is a much healthier reality than one in which you learn for learning's sake. Um, I mean, there's a degree to which that stuff is necessary, you know, um, until you can read and write and, and master basic numbers, you know, there's, there are some limitations. Um, but um, it's, a, it's a much, um, I think it's a much healthier um, environment to imagine where not just not just young people actually but all people are encouraged to pursue their like we said their passion their interests their skills um Absolutely. so it's really interesting to hear how gaming can support that actually you can adapt to those needs um 
I was also just thinking about how you talked about such a collaborative society as well. You've mentioned that a couple of times now in the creation of games and also in the in the execution and the use of them in, in education. Collaboration is really important between all parts yep. of society, between, like you just said, teachers, businesses, creators, and then healthcare, depending on the market that you're looking at. Um, I want to just take us to a, a big question, Natasha. What do you see the future looking like? Um, ten years from now, what does what does the world of gaming look like? Um, do you think? <laughs> if, I, no, if I had that answer, I would already cash it out somehow. But I don't <laughs> think that. That's big point out, big baby. <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately, and whoever says they know, they lie. Otherwise, again, like we wouldn't have so many investors and publishers putting money in the same old things over and over if they, they knew next big thing. So. Um, I'm interested uh, in your vision, though. What's yeah, your in my vision? vision like, mm. At least where I stand, uh, basically, as said, like I think that um, the future actually lays in really supporting the individual. So individual needs and individual interests. And this is where I see also where gaming technology is going forward. Because once again, I mean, our lives are already gamified, like it or not. With all the apps and things, I mean, even this, what we are now using for an interview, it's all part of kind of like gamified solutions that are out there like it or not the kind of this is where we live uh plus social media being one big gamified thing anyway with all the likes and and uh, whatnot so um so the thing here is that i see the future where uh basically developers will be more and more needed to actually give the right um uh, way of creating that experience together with other professionals. So again, kind of growth more of the gaming gamification, although it's not most likely going to be called gamification because that has a stigma around it or serious games or anything like that, but it might be called something else. But all, overall, I see the future in actually utilizing the, the gaming technology into the needs and uh, uh, interests of individuals and the way how they want to uh, personally experience things on their own terms, with their own abilities or disabilities, because again, uh, or, or in general, strengths and weaknesses, because we are all having our strengths and weaknesses, which are part of what makes us so unique individually, both of these stuff. <laughs> so, um, so basically highlighting the unique individual and their needs is something where the future, I would say, the of, of the gaming technology is going, uh, regardless what genre of things we are speaking about. Um, Natasha, as a as a game developer, as a business leader, and as an educator, um, I really wish you all the very best um, for for all of those different projects that you're working on and for that future that you're working towards. Um, we from Synesthesia sincerely wish you the best for the future and very much thank you for everything you've been able to share with us today, your ideas, your vision, um, you know, and everything that's come from, from all of your experience. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was a huge pleasure. And looking forward to collaborate in the future as well. Absolutely. Yeah, high five that. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us for this edition um, with our series of interviews celebrating 10 years of synesthesia. We will see you back for another interview very soon.